What is it you want, Barry? What do you want? You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dying time's here. Come with me if you want to live. That's it, man. Game over, man. Game over. The Force will be with you. Always. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to 20th Century Geek. I'm your regular host, Scott Weatherly, and I recently had the great pleasure to attend the nice comic convention in Bradford. It was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. I was there for both days. I bought some fantastic bits down there. I bought some great indie comics. I'm going to be calling out some of those, especially a good friend of the show now, Matt Garvey, and some of his work. A review of that will be up soon and he will be joining us on the show at some point but more than that i got to speak to two artists i have uh, greatly admired in the past uh one in particular goes back a long way uh, i got to sit down and talk with mark buckingham about his time on miracle man but not just not just his old time on miracle man oh no no, no. we got to talk about new miracle man there's some insights, some nuggets coming up about what is going to be happening with him and Neil Gaiman. Because they are getting to do, that's right ladies and gentlemen, they are getting to do the Silver Age and the Dark Age of Miracle Man. It's coming out in 2020 and we got to talk about it with Mark Buckingham, so strap in for that one. And the other one was an artist who has come a few times, he's done some great works, uh, a series called Deadbeats, uh, a series uh, of... Uh, H.P. Lovecraft adaptations. He did The Mountains of Madness, uh, The Great uh, Case of Charles Dexter Ward. I really enjoy uh, I.N.J. Colbard or Ian Colbard. Great artist, great adapt- uh, adapter. We got to sit down and talk about uh, horror, uh, adaptation, and generally working comics and what the reader wants. So that's a great conversation further in the podcast. So this is the two interviews. Uh, the sound quality is as good as I could get it, I'm afraid. It's actually pretty good. Um, but strap in, sit back. We're going to be talking Miracle Man and we're going to be talking horror. I'll hand you over now. I will doodle while we chat. If okay. That's good. So uh, I'm here at Nice Comic Con in Bedfordshire and I'm being joined by Mark Buckingham, oh. artist, penciler and inker for DC, Mark, all kinds of things, many, many things. Um, but I'm going to ask today if you could focus in on one particular thing uh, that I've done a big thing on in the past, the Miracle Man. Yes. Um, so really, I know you know you were young, starting out when, it, when, it, when you sort of got you picked up uh, Miracle Man. So how did you come to be the artist on? Uh, Neil Gaiman's uh, following Alan Moore? Well, it was a curious thing. Um, I was still starting out in the business. I um, had been attending a, a, an event, well, a, a monthly event in the UK, uh, a meeting of the Society for Strip Illustration. And myself and Neil Gaiman and Dave McKean all joined the same month in sort of January of 1987. And so we sort of got to know each other through that. And um, I had uh, been looking to sort of find a way into the business. And I produced a one-page strip called Strip Aids. Uh, um, no, sorry, called uh, The Party Trick for uh, Strip Aids, which was mm. this charity comic to raise funds for London Lighthouse. It was yeah. in the sort of the, the, the early stages of the AIDS ep- epidemic. And... Uh, you know, they, they were making efforts to try and create uh, somewhere to, to care for, for, for people mm. that were suffering. Uh, so I, I took part in that, and that led to me contributing strips to a, a new humour magazine called The Truth. And um, one of the first things they did when I uh, agreed to start working on that was that they uh, put me together with a three-man writing team, which consisted of... Kim Newman, the horror writer, okay. Eugene Byrne, who uh, edits the West Country equivalent of uh, Time Out, called, um, right. called Venue, and Neil Gaiman. Okay. Uh, so basically that's how I started working with Neil. 
Um, and again, on the back of that, I, um, the people that had done the uh, Strip Aids comic, they had a new project called Heartbreak Hotel. Yeah. And they asked me if I'd do a four-page strip for that. And most of the stuff I was doing at the time was more sort of humor strips. But for mm. that, I tried to do a, a full-on kind of superheroic adventure style a full strip. adventure, the full yeah. work. And, yeah. and I was hugely influenced by um, Gary Leach and Alan Davis's work on Warrior. Okay. <laughs> so um, it, it, it involved a, a female character, a cowgirl, that was uh, very light and she looked like she was weightless. And um, and had the twink Tinkerbell effect around right. her, and I showed this to Neil at the Christmas party mm. of, uh, of the SSI that that December of um, of eighty seven, and he looked at this and he said, "Oh," he said, "The thing is, um, Alan Moore's just asked me if I'd take over writing Miracle Man, mm. or oh, and." Um, I need an artist because you know, you know, I do a lot, all my stuff with Dave, but I can write more than Dave can draw, mm. and this is perfect. This this looks exactly like what what I'm looking for yeah, yeah. for the strip. So, from not virtually nothing, because I had barely had anything in print, I was suddenly offered my dream gig. Yeah, to working sort of like draw, on draw a full strip. So. But in the end, it took uh, over a year. Um, to actually sort out all the contracts to get to us to a point where we could actually s step in and start working on it. Yeah. So um, uh, basically, um, uh, in the intervening time, Neil said, "Oh, we need to get you other work mm -hmm. and get you some experience over in the in the, the American Raise your market." Thing. Well, just 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 physical drawing mm. experience for those kind of comics. And he did talk to me about Sandman, and I sort of panicked and said, well, I'm still at university, <laughs> yeah. I haven't got time to do this. And I kind of said no. Um, and then suddenly thought, what the hell have I just done? Yeah. And then he said, well, look, there's this other possibility that's cropped up, because um, I know Richard Pierce Rayner is going to take over uh, from Jim Ridgway as the artist on um, Hellblazer. Mm. Why don't we see if you can try out to be the inker on that? So you kind of get into working at DC and you get used to the monthly yeah. schedules and stuff. Um, and Karen Berger had said to me when I'd met her a few months before that she wasn't sure if I was quite ready for a penciling gig at DC, but I might have potential as an the inker. So okay. I thought, okay, that this seems to be mm. marrying up quite well. So that's what happened. So the next thing I know, I was working. Uh, inking Hellblazer, um, and so that was my sort of main gig for a year. And halfway through that run, unfortunately, Richard had to leave. But in the intervening period, I'd managed to pencil my first strip to DC, which right. was the Secret Origin of Poison Ivy. Okay, yeah, Again, yeah. Neil wrote me a script and said, yeah. "Oh, this is for you." Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, and because I used a style that was very in keeping with Richards for the way that I illustrated that strip, I kind of then said to Karen, look, 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 I, I can, can take this. over from yeah. Richard. Why don't you give me a chance? So that's basically how my career started, was all these sort of happy kind of opportunities sort of cropping up. And by the time I left Hellblazer, everything was sorted with the contracts for Miracle Man, so we just leapt straight into working for Eclipse. So yeah, this next question is, is so you, you're on Miracle Man, you've been yep. given it, you're ready to go. One of the things I, I love about that first, it is the first arc, because there's going to be more, we'll I'll ask yes. you, isn't it? Yep. But the first arc of the, of the Silver Age is, each issue is, it's a one and done, but it's so beautifully illustrated in different ways. Yes. So was that intentional, or was that something that Neil asked for, or was it you, you exploring? It was intentional, mm. and uh, it was because... Uh, it was basically, um, Neil and I were both, if I'm honest, a little bit anxious about following directly from what Alan and John Tottenham and, and all the yeah. other amazing artists yeah. that Alan had worked with on the series. To, to kind of leap straight in from, from where Alan had left, it was always going to be a tricky mm. thing to do. And, um, you know, he'd left it with this world transformed uh, and, and this Olympus built over the ruins of, of London. Yeah, it's quite, um, it's, quite, it's quite a sort of line drawn, isn't it? Really? Yeah, exactly. You know, and you had this pantheon of mm. superheroic god characters looking down on the world. So we immediately thought, well, rather than trying to 
directly follow with more stories about the Miracle Man and his cohorts. Let's focus on what it's like for everybody down below looking up. Mm. Let's actually do the stories about what it's like to live in this 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 Yeah, how it's changed the world. Age, yes. yeah. And so we, we went for that. We thought, well, we'd tell all these little personal stories. And the other thing that was a worry for me is that at that point, I was so new to the business that I had not formulated a distinctive style of yeah. my own. I was still trying out different things. I still wasn't 100% sure if I was happy with the way I mm. was working. So Neil said, let's make that um, a plus rather than a negative. Let's, let's explore as many different art styles as we can mm. and as many different storytelling techniques as we can because each one will represent the world view of the person whose story mm. we're telling. And, and it worked beautifully. It was, it was very successful. And, um, you know, we went from a style that was not completely different from what John was doing uh, in his stuff for the first issue for A Prayer yeah. and a Hope. But at the same time, the prologue was done with a mix of sort of um, photo montage and crayon and pastel work. And it was, it was quite different in itself. And then we had the retrieval stories in the back, which were our kind of prologue to the yes. Silver Age. And then in the next issue, we went completely in the other direction, and it was this really stark, almost German expressionist sort of style, more akin to someone like Mignola with the, with the strong spot black uh, in just two panels per page. And then we followed that immediately with a kid's strip that was done more as a I sort love of, that issue. I think that was like a 12-panel grid yeah. with... And, and a very cartoony style that was a mix of sort of British comic traditions with a bit of sort of Jamie Hernandez yeah. love and rockets, um, and uh, and we just carried on in that way. You know, the the Warhol one was the one that people remember mm. the most clearly because that was the most avant-garde of the lot. Because I was working in white crayon on black paper, I was doing whole panel, you know, splash panels that were kind of uh, photocopy montage and built out of textures that mm. I was taking from newsprint and that sort of thing. Um, and then there was a, a four page section that I did as full colour art, just trying to completely emulate the pop art of Andy Warhol himself and, and lots of little sort of iconic imagery and that sort of thing. So that was, that was huge fun. And then we did a children's book. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, it's like, what, what do you fancy doing next? Oh, you know, I want to do a children's book. Okay, then well, we'll do a story where we, do, so, we so, get to do that. So you were basically, you were collabor it was a collaborative thing, and it wasn't sort of Neil giving you the script. It was like you both talking. What uh, should we try next? What well, I mean, we Neil, Neil was writing the scripts, but, yeah. but the, the, you know, we, we would meet up regularly. Mm. I mean, and before we started, I went and stayed with Neil for about three days. And we just, you know... Uh, go for long walks and, and just bounce ideas around and sit in front of reruns of the Adams Family drinking mm. Drambuie and <laughs> yeah. you know just babbling about stuff and making little notes and planning out timelines for how the, mm. the Silver and Dark Ages were going to pan out beyond it so I mean within basically before we'd even started we knew what the last issue was going right. to be. I mean, and that's been one of the frustrations for mm. us, ever, you know, ever since it collapsed with uh, with the disappearance of, of Eclipse Comics, is that we were really set on the path that we were going to pursue, and we had that last issue mapped out in our heads, and we could never yeah. get to it. So, um, so that was a, that was a problem. Because it's been an interesting journey, and I think you know, obviously, in 2012, 2014, sort of Marvel reprinted. Uh, each of the issues, they have a supplementary material, and they've got all of them. They're fantastically done, and it ends with that sort of, uh, sort of those the first five or first six of, of, of yours and, and Neil's run. Yeah. But there's one more, isn't there? There's two. There's two. There was two. There was that. The first two issues of the Silver Age were published yeah. by Eclipse, and we actually did do work on the third as right. well. And if I remember, you know, we even did a tiny bit of the fourth. But anyway, the, yeah, the, basically we had, we had made a reasonable run into yeah. the Silver Age. Um, the problem was because Eclipse were going through a difficult moment. They were the, the, the publishing schedule was very sporadic, and also, if I'm honest, um, because we knew that things were not going great there, 
um, they used to take a very long time to pay us. Right. So we would okay. effectively wait to get paid and then we'd start the next one. Okay. Um, yeah. So that was kind of how it went. Um, but yeah, basically, it, it, um, we, had, we had made inroads into the Silver Age. Mm. The problem was, at that point, the idea was that the, stylistically and story wise, it was going to be much more linear and much more consistent. Yes because the idea was that we were returning to the main narrative yeah. now and actually um, looking at the, the re, you know the rebirth of young Miracle Man yeah. and, and what impact that would have on his pantheon of gods right. and taking this, the story forwards and how it would be yeah. now that this world, this new world has bedded in and, mm. and how were people reacting to it. So, so that, was the, that was the plan with the Silver Age. From my point of view, um, because there were still there were jumps between issues, because yeah. as I said, we were having sort of little wait around, and then I come back to it. I was also doing plenty of other strips around it, yeah. for D, mostly for DC, and a little bit of stuff at 2000 AD as well. And the problem is, I kept trying out new techniques and new styles, and then I'd come to do another Miracle Man, it would be like, oh, oh no, I draw like this now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so those first few issues, they, I mean, they're, they, they're very different from mm. each other, even though they were meant to be one linear narrative. So when it came to us finally having the opportunity now to come back to it, I knew that I was going to have to go back and So in those two issues, those you're gonna, you, they are going to be revisited, they, they, you're going to redraw they, they them? They are redrawn, yeah. Oh, you've done them? Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. So, I mean, for those, because I have digitally, I was given, um, someone sent me a sort of scan of one of those issues. It, yeah. I love the, It's a fascinating new story, but... Um, so it's all planned out. You've got the Silver Age and the Dark Age. You sat there in, you know, waiting to be. Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously we, you know, it was it was um, a more sort of sketchy timeline yeah, yeah, back yeah. then, um, and it was always open to some movement as to uh, exactly what we would do with each of those kind of key points mm. on the journey and, um, and what impact it would have on all the characters yeah. involved. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, we, we had that pretty clearly planned, but what's been interesting is since we've sort of returned to the project, um, we've been meeting up regularly just to sort of sit and, and talk it all through. Mm -hmm. and, and it's evolving and changing now that we actually have the opportunity to sit and properly plan it and, and plot it all out in more depth. And obviously we've we've changed a lot as, mm. as, as creators in the intervening 25 years. Yeah, time has you know, an impact. So. Yeah, well also creating, you know, you, we have huge, both produced huge bodies of work yeah. in the intervening period and also matured and grown up as as human beings. Yeah. And our, our sort of understanding of the world, the world itself has changed. Yes. Dramatically in recent years. So you know, there's a lot of new things that we need to take on board yeah. and consider with this work. So that's that's been one of the interesting things. It's been as much a talk about how the world has changed as it is about how our how the story might then be affected. I can't wait for it. Is it, so is it due to sort of start being reprinted next year or? Well, I mean, we've already kind of plotted everything. Yeah. Um, and new scripts are being written, and I'm I'm sort of plugging away. At new at new art as mm. well. Um, I don't know exactly when it's going to come. We had a, a few kind of hiccups along the way, where um, lots of stuff had to be sort of sorted out yeah. again from scratch. Which I'm afraid with Miracle Man has has always been the case. I mean that's why it's taken it's this always, long yeah, to get it it's resolved. It's got such a complex, I mean, I mean, complex were, ownership history. Of, yeah, uh, I mean, there was two decades mm. of ongoing legal battles, and um, you know. He, there's always something that kind of comes up out of the woodwork that you're not expecting that throws a spanner. But um, at this point, there is there is no excuse. Now it's just me being a bit distracted, being a dad of a little mm. three-year-old, and not necessarily <laughs> life getting in the way. Yeah, the, the, with me, it's a bit more life getting in the way yeah. more than anything. And obviously, Neil's horrendously busy, but uh, we're co-writing this stuff now, so I'm uh, I'm trying to do my best. To, to, to carry a lot of the load One. on on the uh, the plotting and, yeah. and writing side as well, so that we can actually get the thing moving. Excellent. Um, 
So, um, so that's been that's been terrific. But uh, no, I'm really enjoying yeah. being back on it. Oh, it's going to be massive! I can't wait. Mark, fantastic. My pleasure. Excellent. Love really appreciate that. Yeah, I'm at Nice. I'm at the Nice Comic Convention in Bedford, and I'm being joined by Ian Corbett, uh, artist. And uh, I've read multiple his things. You've done some. Uh, well, firstly, welcome Ian. Thanks Hello. for joining me on the podcast. Thanks for giving me your time. No worries. Um, I sort of came across your arts with your Lovecraft uh, adaptations. Yeah. Uh, particularly, I sort of started with uh, the, the case of Charles Dexter Ward, and then I've, I've, I've tried out a few more. Um, and we also know, sort of having listened to the uh, HP podcast, literary podcast, yeah. both uh, Chris Lackey and, and, and uh, Chad Pfeiffer, so sort of, yeah. you know, I've mentioned that, I've known that. So, really, I just want to say Lovecraft mm. and the weird fiction side of things. Yeah. Uh, was it something you wanted to explore, or was it something that sort of was, uh, you know, you sort of was fo- foisted on you, would be, oh, no, for want of a better phrase? Did I want to explore it? No. <laughs> That's the answer to that. I started out. Um, I'd been doing Sherlock Holmes for Self Made Hero. Okay. And I quite like Doyle rather mm. than just simply Holmes. I quite like his other writing as well. So, um, interesting stuff. And uh, particularly because with Doyle, he wrote kind of reportage, fictional reportage mm. pieces. So he'd make it seem like it was a true story, but it was actually fiction. Yes. He got a letter from someone outraged by an event he wrote about <laughs> once, but it was actually just a story. So I remember that. But the. Um, so we were doing, so that was what drew me to Dawn, and then, then we were talking about the possibility of doing Lost World mm. as an adaptation, because I wanted to do quite a different take on Lost World, um, looking at the way that the Victorians represented dinosaurs and just taking that template from there and just oh, doing okay. it like a, of that period, but also looking at Britain politically at the time and yeah. how that encroached on the rest of the world and loads of little things I wanted to take an angle on from a modern perspective. Yeah, yeah. I've always taken a lot of it, um, especially when it came to then taking that and going to something like Lovecraft. Because uh, uh, So originally I wanted to do Lost World, backtracking on that in a second, and, um, and the publisher said everybody wants to do Lost World, which is a fair point. And so... Um, then I remember just scanning the bookshelves mm. and seeing as one of the spines said at the Mountains of Madness. I remember, and I remember thinking, well, that's got snow in it. That'll be <laughs> easy to draw. So I said, um, I'll do that. I'll do the Mountains of Madness. It just happened to be that at that very moment, they were putting together an anthology of Lovecraft stories. Mm. And so uh, the idea of having alongside that as an accompanying piece, a uh, full graphic novel for them yes. was the bait, effectively. So I was within half an hour already working on the project. So right. was, yeah, it was really instantaneous, and then not really knowing what I was getting into. But a lot of that, like you know, taking Lovecraft, then I started to look at it, you know, with the ideas that I'd had of what I wanted to do with Lost World, mm. kind of then were put onto what I was then going to do with Lovecraft. Mm. And there's a there's a weird source of inspirations for this of things like. Um, Lost Horizon by Franz Capra, uh, Frank Capra, and yeah. then um, um, John Fowles' French Lieutenant's Woman. There's a bit in that where it's like that's a romance written, it's a postmodern work right. written about Victorian romances. It has yeah. two alternative endings to the story, but it's also looking through the perspective and the lens of modern day, looking back on history through that time. So I was really interested in adapting classics in that mm. way using some element of that in some way, not sure how I was going to do that. And so coming to Lovecraft, um, yeah, I mean, it seemed like right for that. And especially on the first read of that, it was like a, a ripping yarn type. Mm. The way it starts, it's got sort of like a, a travelogue feel to it. Yeah. And then it becomes this horrible adventure. I quite like the peeling back of reality when it's like you think it's going one way and then all of a sudden oh my god it's a horror story yeah just take quite a left turn at yeah, one point, yeah and that was a massive appeal mm. and so yeah that was really where it kind of started off thinking this will be easy because there's no dialogue yeah. and then actually having to dialogue the book 
Yeah. And then also uh, thinking this will be easy because it's snow and actually undermining the, <laughs> and, you know, not thinking through the fact that it's um, underestimating the fact that snow is actually um, a pain in the ass. Not, yeah, it can be <laughs> <laughs> to draw. And then the, uh, the other factor to it was things like characterization. So his, uh, he talks about his characterization being quite weak. Mm. He's not wrong, because he, but then again, it's the style of how he writes. It's yeah. like they're not really fresh. You kind of a hovering observer over a horror that you have no control over. You're almost like a dream entity. Yeah, yeah. Like you're not really in control of this. And so the, yeah. the characterization's true in that regard. Not completely true, because you know, Joseph Kerwin as a villain is pretty phenomenal. Mm. You know, it's quite a scary guy. It's almost like you know, Tim Burton esque. He wants to, mo he enjoys the monsters and the villains more yeah. than the. the oh the, yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a sense of it. You know, so I was quite interested in using that because to me that's a blank slate. Yeah. <coughs> and then I can actually just do whatever the hell I want there. Yeah, yeah. And so I would kind of just took his characters, turned them into actual characters, and then mm. had, you know, th as in a, as if you were putting on a stage play. And they need to be able to talk to each other, so I've injected character into them, I've given them reasons to do what they're doing and yeah. motivation isn't a strong point I mean, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> so um and then that ended up being the book yeah and there were little things in it like i made changes of um yeah there were quite a few changes but <clears throat> but i always felt like it was important to um there were two factors that i had to stick to was um sticking to when you're adapting something you're sticking to the medium, you have to kind of do it for the medium that mm. you're adapting it to, but, yeah. but also stay faithful to the spirit of the story. So the bits that you cut out, you cut out because they they won't work in the other medium, or you change them to fit or work that medium. Yeah. Because really, if you want the book, read the book. So adapt, adaptation is about change and shifting onto something yeah, else. Yeah, it, so. it is. It's adapted, isn't it? Yeah. So they say, I say the uh, Mount Madness is rife with heavy description. Yeah. Light, light on sort of dialogue, and I suppose yeah. I said you've got to turn that into it. Because um, I was thinking about it in the context, I was talking in France um, at a convention there, and we, we were talking about this with a French translator, and something came up in regard to Baudelaire, for example, when he translated Poe into French. Mm. There's a hell of a lot of Baudelaire in that, and that's the, you know, and also we were talking about the way that Lovecraft translates in French. It must be amazing in French, because yeah. they view it as. We were talking, I was trying to define like purple prose, for example. Another weakness of his is when we're talking about purple prose, but the guy that was the translator was saying, no, it's gothic. So, yeah. But you're, you're then thinking, well, when you're translating that and you're putting it for audiences there, you're dressing it up as something completely different mm. to the source material. So it must read incredible in yeah. French. You know, it must be something entirely different experience. I, mean, I, 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 but Lovecraft's one of those. I think like Poe and these yeah. sort of, I say, more gothic writers. Yeah. I always, I've, I've thought about the same, like you know. But to, being translated into sort of European language, I can see that it's probably easier. But, like Lovecraft has a whole like Japanese contingent. Like, yeah, exactly. So turning it to Japanese must be incredible. Like I, I can't read or, or you know. Oh. Uh, I think your cultural it, frame of reference and your, the language you speak defines how you how you perceive things and mm. all those, those elements about how you how you look at things they're going to be seen in quite a different way yeah with a different sort of perspective to begin with when they're reading it so mm. it must it must be that, that probably is what explains that popularity yeah i think it's a few adaptations yeah. uh, you know you've seen the advance of madness i really enjoyed Ch the case of charles dex ward yeah but you also uh, adapted uh, dream quest of the unknown to death yeah yeah that's, that that story is an unusual entity. So what, how was adapting that? Because that's uh, a really odd one. Yeah, that is odd. Uh, my my editor <laughs> on that book is not a fan of the dream cycle at all. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, it's a tough one to get through. Yeah, well, I'd done, um, I'd adapted uh, A Princess of Mars. Oh, okay, yeah. And this is effectively his Princess of Mars. Really. Yeah. So it's, it's not like, um, when it came to this one, I kind of, what I was trying to do with the four that I've had it picked was to just try to look different, because my, my goal was ultimately to go, what's so good about this guy? Why is it that like Stephen King liked reading him? Yeah. Why is it that he's so, you know, why is it that he's, there's now a sub-genre in horror after him? Why is it that, you know, Alan Moore was a fan, Alan Moore, recent um, Providence. 
Mm. Uh, Neil Gaiman's a fan. Why does Guillermo del Toro so badly want to make a Mountains of Madness movie? Yeah. And, uh, all these things yeah. were real questions when I went into looking at it to, to sort of guide me on like what I was trying to figure out. Like, mm. What is good about this? And let's so let's start with the things that he's known for, such as the the, the most kind of flowery language, if you like, or the five words when he could use one. Yeah. And gut it, completely get rid of it. And then uh, start from scratch and basically break the whole thing down and start from, uh, from, from nothing. And fundamentally what you end up with is, and also, you know, take uh, Chekhov's gun to some of the prejudices of the period or anything like anything like um, or this is a necessary aspect in some of the storytelling or whatever and actually tell it as a book on its own right and a, and a piece of work now yeah it's a bit like John Fowles' French Left Tennis that's why right. I keep going back to that yeah so it's it was a bit like taking that as an exercise and seeing what is good about it if there's anything good at all and um, and trying to find story now that's subject to my own subjective opinion of that so effectively what you're reading is a very subjective piece of work yeah of that. but like going through it, what was the original question the complexity of adapting um, dream quest and then that ah, seemed to be sort of you know i thought there was no choice to adapt it yeah, so, no, so the point was that i was trying to find four different types of things that he does yeah so I think I only really found three in the end, because <laughs> I think Shadow Over Innsmouth is a bit like the other two. Yeah. But it's really like, so you've got the ripping yarn in uh, Mountains of Madness, you've got the detective story, effectively, in Charles Dexter mm. Ward. You have a combination of the two with Shadow Over the yes. They are basically to those two books combined. And then you get to um, Drew Crystal and then Good App, which is a completely different thing entirely. It's like a Narnia book or something like that. It's like a walking through the wardrobe into another world and having an adventure and then coming back again. Yeah. So yeah. It is that kind of like... It always feels like the first, the first or second draft though to me, because it's sort of yeah. like, some of the things, it's like so it's listed off like, oh, I want to do this, this and this, or oh, put it in here, but yeah. it never quite... It never quite adds up as a story for me. This is yeah. fascinating, is it? I think it's like, when I was going over... When I was looking at how I wanted to do the first one, I, I remember writing the first one and trying to Mountains of Madness and trying to write it as if um, Rod Serling had picked it up and tried to write okay. it. Okay. Right? Yeah. And I was trying to think of it like Rod Serling's written the script. Now Frank Capra is going to direct this. So that's how I did that first book. Yeah. So th but then, like when I was looking at that last one, it was very much like lining up, trying to think how would someone back in those days have dressed this up like mm. this, you know, and tried to put on a production if they'd made like a. Uh, and I was thinking more in terms of like stuff like Flash Gordon and those sort of serials. Right, yeah. When I came to that one. So I was trying to look at it through that, like that sort of perspective and trying to piece that together. And how that came about, I mean, during the production of it as well, I did this because I did weird things during each book uh, to get me thinking in a certain way. It sounds a bit weird, but, the, but the, this one was like keeping a dream diary and it was trying to. So what I would do is I would record a dream when I'd just woken up, because I dream right. quite a lot. So I'd record a dream when I woke up, and then I would, the next day I would record a dream at midday, and the next day I'd record a dream at some point in the afternoon, if yeah. I remember to do it. And I would look at how the narrative changes in terms of what I recall, and how structured and linear they become. During um, the day. So when they're like, when you first wake up, they're kind of a jangled mess. Yeah. And then they iron out, and the longer you have for something, it just makes it more... But your consciousness sort of starts to put that linear yeah, pattern Yeah, you start to line things up and mm. act almost, like act one, act two, act three, and so on. <laughs> and I, um, so I kind of tried to get my head around like how this story was going to be told that way, using all the source material and pulling it together. Yeah. But, um, yeah. And it is a weird book. Yeah. But it's, it's meant to be like completely different flavour. Brilliant. from the other ones. So. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> and how you do that, I don't know. <laughs> like, I'm trying to think back on four or five years ago of how I did it. Other than the Dream Diary, that's all I can remember, really remember about it. No, it's good. I really enjoy it. It's, they're all, it's a, it's, it's not, it was not a choice. Right? Yeah. I love the idea that you take it as like a, like you say, Princess of Mars, you know, sort of uh, serial adventure. That's, quite a, that's a cool idea. But actually. it also isn't. What it isn't is, like, the thing I noticed was, like, this. Um, so da if you took something like David Lynch, mm. and he works in dream logic, so mm. in other words, everything has like a symbolic, a symbolic thing about it that he doesn't need 
feel that it's necessary to explain or whatever. So it can be quite alienating to certain audiences when you, when you see stuff that he's done. Others people try to, it becomes like a treasure hunt to try and figure out what yeah, the meaning yeah. is and stuff like that. And I think when it comes to the, uh, something like Dream Quest on Kadaf, my first reading of it, there was no dream logic to it. It was mm. much more storyless. So it has its own built-in understanding. Yeah. I think that's not the strongest aspect. Of it. No. You no. Know, I'd like to have uh, probably done one where it was much more reliant on dream logic. So you wonder what the hell is going on. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, 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 yeah. There's one, the silver ship. Yeah. That one. Yeah. yeah that one goes all over the place. Yeah. 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 That's. I'm trying to think now. <laughs> It seems, yeah, I've completely lost all my points of reference for it now, in terms of my, I've cleared all that off my mental hard drive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's good. Stuff, but, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's been fascinating. So, um, you know, I'm taking it, so I'm going to eat on with your, um, your drawing. Yeah, and yeah, you go, in, you but, uh, uh, I'll leave you to it. And yeah, yeah. Ian, it's been fantastic talking to you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cheers for that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, there we have it. Some great discussions there that were held with uh, the fantastic Mark Buckingham and uh, Ian Colbard. Uh, I'm fantastic to know more about what where Miracle Man came from and the fact that a young Mark, Buck- Mark Buckingham was given such a chance on uh, on such comics. So, I hope you enjoyed those. This was just a short interlude. Uh, it's filled some space. It's been I love the information we got from there. I enjoyed the interviews and uh, I highly recommend checking out the nice. Uh, it's NICE convention uh, next year, uh, associated with Close Encounters comic shops, uh, Peterborough, Bradford, and uh, Northampton. Uh, CloseEncounters.co.uk. Check them out online. Check out their stores. Really highly recommend those. Great guys. Um, but next week, I am. This is going to be just a week. So this is just an interim, an interim, a, a placeholder, if you will. Uh, for the next episode so this is just some interviews next week there were some technical difficulties I've had to work hard to wrangle the Moon Knight that's right next week's episode is all going to all going to be about uh, the Avatar of Khonshu the Fist of Khonshu the Protector of the Night Traveller's Moon Knight so I'm really looking forward to that um, so in the meantime though, if you want to reach out you want to talk about this you want to talk about comic conventions or Miracle Man anything at all Give me a shout. Please contact me at 20thCenturyGeek at gmail.com or at 20thCenturyGeek on all the social medias, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, all those kinds of things. Reach out, say hello. If you want to take part in the show, if you want to contribute to the show in some way, please go on your uh, podcast catcher, the thing where you listen to your podcast, and give us a five-star review. It's greatly appreciated, and uh, it helps us raise our profile and lets more people out there just listen to the show uh, if you want to show even more po- uh, positive support we do have a Patreon account and we appreciate everybody that joins us on there uh, we do special podcasts every other, every month I look at an older film that's probably got a, a less than stellar reputation and uh, ask the question is it really that bad uh, and then I'm joined by my non-nerdy wife Alex to watch something incredibly nerdy and just see how she reacts to it. Uh, other things, we also have an Amazon wish list, and on there are all kinds of books and things that help us with our research. And of course, we love secondhand books in 20th Century Towers. So please reach out, say hello, to help contribute and support the show if you can. If you can't, just listen along and enjoy. We do appreciate it. Okay, so next week, that's next Wednesday, we'll be back and we will be talking Moon Knight. So have a good week. And I'll see you soon. Mm-hmm.